Um, I would like to tell you that I've personally worked with uh, Saxon. Uh, we collaborated on a project together, and it was one of the most inspiring collaborations I've ever done with any artist. He is the nicest guy, and he's really, really talented. Um, Saxon is perhaps America's premier um, gar was a garden and horticultural photographer. You probably have some of his books in your home because he's actually done 21, am I correct, 21 now? Um, garden books of all kinds of varieties. And I found that I had like half of them and I didn't even know it until I met him. Um, the books are wonderful. Some of them include Smith and Hawkins books. You remember the 100 English roses and the heritage roses? Um, his current one is the American Meadow book, which is fabulous. He's also a really prolific writer. Um, He's a fellow of the Garden Writers of America Association. Now, add in the development of his company, Photobotonics, which is a 200,000 photographic horti uh, horticultural resource site. And you wonder, how the heck does he have time for his own garden? Because he has a beautiful garden, very varied, very interesting. Um, I tried to get him one of my roses, but it didn't quite work for his garden. But I hope he talks a little bit about it. Saxon's work, for me, is mesmerizing, frequently exotic, and always educational. Today, we're fortunate to have this extremely gifted fellow from our own Marin County right here to talk to us about how to photograph roses. And please know that when he came in and saw the photographs in the back, he went, hmm, that's different. <laughs> because you'll see it's not quite the work that he does. So please give a warm welcome to Saxon Holt. OK. Um, Ronnie mentioned that I have a, um, a new business. I have lots of businesses. One's called Photo Botanic. I'm doing a workshop, an uh, online workshop on garden photography. It was when I agreed to do this presentation, I thought for sure it would be ready to go. I could announce it and show everyone my, my workshops. But it's, not, it's about two or three weeks away. Um, I have a, a sign up here for any of you folks who would like to sign up and be on my um, workshop list. It's an online workshop that I do. Um, I, I'll leave it up here rather than pass it around. But I hope folks will be interested. Um, Actually, I'm particularly interested in being here with the Rose Group because I'm realizing um, as I do my new e-commerce business, I'm doing self-publishing. I've done, I think, eight or nine different Rose books. And the presentation I did today is going to be a new book. I mean, just, it's so ready-made for photographing roses. Um, I'm going to have to add a little extra chapter to it. They're realizing that what a lot of you guys do, and a lot of the uh, Rose Society people do, are close-ups of, of roses. So I've, I've been a judge of some of the rose things. I don't know why I forgot that I should show how to photograph really tight close-ups of roses, because that's really important for, for judging and for people getting their photography skills. What I'm more known for is my uh, gardening and landscape photography. Um, I'm a gardener myself, as Ronnie said. Um, I've been a gardener all, all my life. I started as a commercial photographer, and um, realized I didn't like being indoors. I really liked gardening. So I, about 30 years ago, switched to, to garden photography. Um, so, and the roses are just something I've always loved myself. I have made myself uh, stop at 13 roses in my garden. I just can't have more than that, have, have a, uh, just not enough room. One of those interesting things, though, is you'll see a picture of this later. I have a large, or did at one point, have a large row of eucalyptus between my neighbor and myself. I love rambling roses, and I, I, I topped those uh, trees at about 30 feet and grew rambler roses up into them, and they, they cascade down. It's just fantastic. You know, it's a, you'll see some pictures of that. Could use a eucalyptus, right? <laughs> yeah. So, also, I have this is a new presentation for me. Um, I'm really excited about it. I, I put a lot of material in it from many, many different books that I've done over the years, and I'm glad there's actually no speaker following me, so that I'm, I don't feel like you know we're already a little bit behind. Um, if anyone has to get up and leave for uh, lunch, or you know, I, I will try to go through this, but I have a feeling 
um, it'll be very exciting to see some of the pictures and, and how we made them and just look at them and, and try to, to analyze what went into them. Um, uh, the, the, the first part of my uh, spiel, John, I'm okay? <laughs> Did I get electrocuted? <laughs> I'm still standing. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Just in the center of the podium. Okay. Part of my spiel in all my workshops um, is to take a good picture. Very first thing is you have to have a good garden. That's just you have to have a good garden to work in, and then fill your frame with what you see. Um, this is a. I hope you will agree with me. When the time we're finished, this will be the most ordinary picture of the whole presentation. But it's 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 it's, it's heirloom old garden roses in Oregon. Um, a, when I, I've been there many times, it's a great inspiration to go there. And, um, but I've actually used this particular picture in publishing to show screening, a privacy hedge between the street and the garden. So um, when, when you're taking pictures, you should know why you're taking the picture, what it's going to be used for, and, and let your picture tell a story and fill the frame up with everything in it. Um, um, this is, um, as you know, is probably the first English rose, Constance Spry. Um, can everyone read the title at the top? Okay, I tried to make them small so they wouldn't be too distracting, but I know it's important um, to know the names of things for you guys. I'm part of what, what makes me um, keep being able to publish and, and work with various publishers is I really like to know the name of my plants. I don't really, uh, it's like knowing a friend. I have a terrible memory, um, but if you know someone's name, it's easy to remember it. And I just, and that's, and I'm a gardener myself, and, and part of my job is to communicate to gardeners how to garden better. So if they don't have the right name of things, you're not going to help people. So um, I try to put all the names and all the uh, roses very carefully. Um, this is Constance Pry. I run this great bench at Old Garden Roses in, um, in Oregon. Um, when, you, when you find a place like this, and you're, I'm, I'm going to speak to all of you as if you're photographers. So that's just, you know, when, when you find a place like this as a photographer, you need to work the scene. What is it you're really seeing? You see something that's really fabulous, so you can start working it getting closer to it and getting compositions that really sing. It's not just grabbing the first thing you see. It's to think about it. Um, I always try to work with uh, a tripod so that I can very carefully frame up the, the composition and know exactly what I'm doing. Um, the slightest bit of uh, change in a composition makes a huge difference. Um, you, if you want to fill the frame with everything that's important, don't just grab the shot and hope to clean it up later. I really you know, for my workshops and anyone who wants to be very serious about photography is you must use a tripod. Um, you, can really, you can frame things up so much better that way. Um, this is a recent um, shoot I just did for uh, Conard Pyle. Um, I, I was, for two years I was not able to show these pictures because it was a new uh, rose they introduced and they, and they, were, they had not grown enough to, to sell it and they couldn't tell anyone about it. Um, I knew it at the time as um, um, Pink Eden, it's an Eden rose that they were just calling pink at the time. Now they've, um, and they, they just, for their new catalog, they've, they've, they have two pictures that I took in it. I'm gonna show how we, how we got to these, these pictures in the book. Um, it was only known, only one ma a man in uh, Southern California found this as a sport in his garden. He's a, I think he's a member of British Rose Society. He's know, knew the folks at Conard Pyle and Star Roses and said, hey, I, I, you're, you're, you might be interested in this. And they, they were blown away by this uh, pink Eden. Um, and so they agreed, they, they bought the rights to it from him and agreed to start uh, populating it. But the only place it was growing was his garden. Um, so I had to go down there to photograph it so we could get enough material for the catalog. Um, and, I, and part of the difficulty of any rose shoot is trying to find good light when you're outdoors. The hard, bright sunlight is really tough for, for any kind of garden photography. It creates really dark shadows and really bright highlights. The, the camera, the eye can see that, but the camera can't. Um, so I had to um, put up a big, uh, like a parachute cloth, a big scrim, I call it, um, to protect the, um, the light from hitting the rose. I waited until late in the afternoon um, so that this, this scrim, as you can see, is on the, it's on the west side of this one little uh, location the man had for his, his climbing rose. So the, the scrim is on the west side. So as the sun went down, um, it could soften the light 
uh, so, so the rows would look full. Um, and, um, and then one of the most important things for, for my work uh, is getting the color right. Um, and it can vary a lot. The, the, the outdoor, any of you who take pictures outdoors know the sun, sunlight changes a lot from bright sunny days to deep shade to green under the shade of trees. The light, the color changes a lot. Um, I use this, this device. It's, it's a gray card. It's a little, simple little piece of cardboard. It's an industry standard in the photography world. And I can put it in front of my camera next to the color I'm trying to do and later on match the color of the gray. It's a known gray. So when I go into my editing tool, I use Photoshop, I can tell Photoshop this is gray. This is a very, called 18% gray. It's a very neutral gray. Um, so when I, when I, so when I get back my images back in the computer after the shoot, I can balance all of them to the right color of that day. The, the light in the sky is very different all throughout the day. So I, so I have to get it exactly right. Um, I want to go through this real quickly. This is another, the, you can see the, um, you know, how they, they, they crop this from, from that. But this is um, uh, how, a, how the gray card can really change. This is the same rose, um, and you can see the three different colors of the rose based on the three different color temperatures of the camera. Um, the, if you shoot in the, in the shade, you know, there's a blue light. Um, the reason that is, is when the sun is not shining on something, the light that's touching the subject is blue sky. So it's blue light that's hitting things when it's in the shade. So you need to correct for that. Um, so, but if I took a straight shot in the shade, it would come out blue. Um, if you shoot with, um, th these two are very, very close, and that's where I needed the, the color calibration in Photoshop. Photoshop knows what 18% gray means in photography. So I can calibrate so I can get the exactly the right 18%. But um, it's, especially for something like this where I'm working for a customer and they've got to get the color right. You know, it's, it's, it's not, a lot of times we are fairly forgiving um, in the horticultural world about colors because everyone's a little bit different. The, your cultural considerations, your climate, your fertilizer, the time of year, the first blossom or the last blossom, there's a lot of ver variety in the color uh, that we all experience. So when we see a photograph, we either think it's exactly right or we think it's close enough and we love it just because it's a, you know, a nice plant. But for the growers, there's not a lot of margin for error. So I've got to get it exactly right. Um, so that I can get the colors presented to them when they get it. I have a calibrated uh, monitors on my, my computers and assuming my clients use calibrated monitors, everyone gets the same color so that when it gets in the catalog, it's exactly what it looked like in, when I photographed it. Um, sometimes I go a little, a, little, a little far off the deep end with so some of it, my work. This is a, uh, I spent a lot of time with, with Photoshop filters and I do a sort of painterly stuff and I have a whole workshop on that. But, um, I won't go with that today, but I think you guys really want to know how I actually photograph the roses. Um, that's me. Um, that's me uh, 25 years ago. Um, but, but I wanted to have a shot to show what's all the various features that are involved in, in taking my business rose pictures. On the, on the left, you see the big screen I put up for the because I had to photograph the whole bank of roses. Um, that was so that I don't, don't do this very often. Um, for clients, most of the time, I work really early in the day between, the, between dawn and two hours and in the late evening. Let, let first and last two hours of the day are, are, are the only really times to work for garden photographers. Um, so I, I don't normally need to do this kind of uh, work. Um, but for this, since I was traveling to Southern California, I had one day they, they hired me to do it. I had to get it that day. I couldn't hope for fog or, get, or assume it would all be done in the morning and the evening. So I, I made sure I had the big piece of scrim that I could make sure I got the job done. More often, though, when I'm working on my own, I carry um, a, a fold-up scrim and a reflectors. Um, here's my gray card down there. Um, these days, this is, say, 20 years ago, uh, now and if most photographers use these fold-up round discs that are very portable. Um, this was an old uh, studio umbrella that was, you know, you can see you can fold it in and out, but they didn't, there weren't, there was twist-up uh, discs weren't available at the time. But, the, but the, the concept is still is the same, that I'm photographing a, a red rose. You can see in the background, it's, it's really hot there. This is actually in the shade. 
Red is almost the hardest colors to photograph. Um, that they call, I get what's called a lipstick effect. It's like you smear lipstick across the reds. And if you're trying to get good definition in red when you're printing it or seeing it printed, um, the reds often block up. It's really, reds are really hard. I, I try to stay away from them. I don't think I have any red plants in my garden just for that. I, I don't like photographing red. <laughs> it's really tough. Um, but you can imagine, I mean, that's, it, this, is, this is all blocked up. So, um, so if, if I'm doing a shoot for a, um, for a client, and I know that the, the, that one specimen, that flower, in this case the rose, has to be right, I will, I can shoot in the middle of the day for, for close-up stuff because the, the sun is very bright and so it's, it's really, it works well going through the reflectors. And then sometimes I'll, I'll have a little extra reflector. This is a, um, it looks, it's, it's gold, but actually when you buy them in the photo stores, they're called sunlight. They actually reflect the color of sunlight. So it looks, it doesn't look too yellow when you bounce the light back. It doesn't change the color too much. So, I will often um, you sit up on a tripod, hold you know, the screen with one hand, and then put a reflector underneath. I don't use reflectors that much, to be honest. I, I, don't, I don't really enjoy a lot of close-up work. I mean, I don't like being anyway in the hot sun, working during the day. Um, and I, I find if I can shoot in the really good light, I don't need reflectors. That can, um, it's, it, it's nice to kick light in there, but oftentimes the um, just the difficulty of holding all the pieces, the winds going around and forth. I don't use them a lot, but um, uh, this, I see Gary Scales in the audience. Where is he? Where is Gary? There he is. Gary is an excellent photographer. Um, he gives me credit for helping him, but, but whenever I work with my workshop people, it's always meet people who are, who are excited about photography and teach me something. Um, Gary, and I worked at his garden um, years ago to photograph um, roses and showing Gary how to photograph. This is the same thing where this is in Gary's garden where the rose is in hot, bright light. You try to take a picture of it, it's just not going to work. All it takes is, is putting a scrim, putting a round disc over top of it and softening the light. It's just like night and day. It's, so I, I always carry these little fold up discs with me. I, I have, well, I'm, I might have six or eight of them in my car at all times, but I always keep a little tiny one, the one that can fold up in my vest with me, and one that's about this big that I can carry around the garden without forgetting where I, I had it. Um, and they, the really big ones actually are, are, they make really big ones, but they're tough both to hold and then the wind catches them. So uh, I recommend ones that are about 20 inches across. Um, and that's all it took for this one. It's just a little bit of a, uh, a you, in my whole right place, <laughs> putting the scrim right above there. Um, it's no, and same thing in Gary's garden. Um, oftentimes when you have a scrim, you're looking at a rose straight on. Rather than looking straight down, you want to look into the rose, get a profile with the stem, and then the, all the background becomes a problem. Sometimes you can just mitigate that, again, with the, um, with the scrim over top of it, it softens everything. And it's okay to still have a few little highlights in the background. It looks, it looks more gardeny, but, but the bright lights here are softened. Um, by the scrim, so it's, it's a very easy fix. And, and for any, any of you photographing in your own garden, um, it's like a no-brainer to, to get one of these discs. Um, and I, actually Gary might tell me, I guessed this rose as fame. I don't know, it's the only rose in the whole, my whole presentation that I wasn't absolutely sure, because normally I have all the IDs. When I went in Gary's garden, Gary has, any of you been in his garden, he has a lot of roses. And, <laughs> and, and uh, I just don't, didn't keep good notes, so I want to make sure you tell me if this is fame or not. I guessed at it, um, but um, it's also in Gary's garden. Um, one of the problems of, of being a California photographer is a lot of my publishers think California is, well, California is bright and sunny, but they want to see bright blue sky, and they want to have sunny light. Well, I, as I said earlier, for photography, for garden photography, bright light is really hard. It's really, you know, it may work fine for mountains and lakes. We have bright light, but for gardens, it's just, it's just tough. So if you want to take a picture of a, of a rose um, and get blue sky, it's, you just can't do it immediately because when you expose, the right exposure for the rose or any flower is exposing the color here. And often that's, it's, it's dark and it's in a shady area, so you have to overexpose, you have to brighten everything so that so the flower looks good. When you brighten everything, then the sky is gonna be really bright. So the great miracle of Photoshop is you can go in later and you just and, and change it back out. Um, you also see I, I, can, change, I, can, I can remove little, little blemishes later. But um, 
But this, this row has really worked really well because I'm looking from underneath to the up, and so that's translucent. So you're getting this really good color of red. This Altissimo is really hard to photograph looking straight at it. But from underneath looking up, where you get some translucent light, it really, it really sinks. Reds really work well that way. You know, if you want to shoot pink roses, you don't want to use backlight because it'll all wash out. But a good, strong red is wonderful for backlight. Um, uh, and the, the, these days, often with digital tools, it's so much easier to take photographs. And, and when I started with film, there was not the, the film has even less latitude than than um, the digital files, and you had no control as a photographer. You'd send the film out to the publisher and and hope they knew what they were doing. Most of them do, but they, but they had no time to spend on each photograph. Now, with, with my work, I can spend you know, an extra 10 minutes, 15 minutes is all, and make this uh, photograph have enough dynamic range so that so the brights and the darks work and brighten up the blue, and it's, it's really a pretty quick fix. Um, so one of the other things of um, trying to photograph um, roses is trying to find a setting that sets it off so that you know your, your photographs are going to come back looking good. Um, years ago, I did four books for Chronicle and Ray Ray Dell. I don't know if you remember Ray's, uh, yeah. We did four little square book years ago. Um, it was a wonderful project, and you'll see more pictures from these. That, um, I think this was the cut, the uh, hybrid, this might be American Rose, uh, all American Rose. This is Paradise. Anyway, this rose, Phyllis Sacani, is a great rose grower in uh, Santa Rosa, or it was. I haven't lost, I've lost touch with Phyllis. Notice this, I've, I've lined up this rose so it's against her, her dark container. Um, so, so, so when I come in tight, I have something, I've got this dark shape. So when I'm looking, when I'm, when I'm in the garden trying to find out where to take the picture, I know my subject, we, we needed to find paradise for this book. I had a target of, I think we had oh, 50 or 40 different roses we had to find for the book. Um, so when I've, I'm looking around the garden, where do I photograph it? If, if worse comes to worse, I can't find anything better, I can at least isolate it here against that container. As it turned out, I, I stood back on the grass and, and looked back at the garden. Um, actually, no, I left out a picture. That's not it. Oh, well, there's, there's, another, there's another great shot of Paris looking back. <laughs> One of the, uh, this, this next series is, is talking about trying to find uh, elements in a garden so that the colors line up. Um, this is a knockout rose, which is another really hard rose to photograph. It's so red. Um, it's, it's, it's slightly overexposed, so, the, so, the, so it's not really dark red. But notice the, um, the blue, it's a salvia uh, in the background of this garden. By just moving around a little bit, I'm, I, I get from, from this angle, I, I got up and looked down. So that now this blue, Blue's there is now behind it. It separates pink and blue. It just—it's a winner. You cannot go wrong with pink and blue in a photograph. So, um, so I look for those compositions. I try to. One of my uh, workshop lessons is called uh, shape and color. So this these, this is a shape. The, the shape of the pink and the blue are complementary shapes, negative and positive areas. So, just look for that. Um, don't just grab the first shot you, you you see. What's going on? I think when when I'm standing in this garden, this is a filoli. Well, most of you have been to Filoli. It's a fantastic garden. Very formal, not quite you know, uh, drought tolerant, but, um, but, I, but, I, but walking around the garden, you can see, you can see these elements you know, coming together. So it's like, well, well yeah, I'll try to make that pink and the blue work together. It's, it's thinking about what you're really seeing and what the camera is going to see. You, know, you, you can walk around the garden and say, oh, that pink and the blue is great. I'm going to take a picture of it. Well, the camera is not thinking the way you're thinking. You need to you know, make sure you get exactly the elements that you want. Um, yeah. Same with one of the other books we did with Ray Ray Dell was a book on miniature roses. It was really fun. Um, the same concept of finding the, 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 um, the blue and the pink worked with this shot. It's the same, you know, I say pink and blue is a winner. It's hard to go wrong with color photography and I have pink and blue. Um, I think we ended up using this in the book. Almost, almost all the shoots I went on for that book, we, we, we had we had pictures of things because the miniature roses are so small, it's hard to get a sense of how small they are. I mean, this is um, cheer up. Uh, it's, a, it's a really small rose, but you don't really realize it until you see a hand in it. So, so I think we used the picture with the hand um, in, in, to give a sense of scale. Again, that's what, what are you trying to communicate? Simply showing that, it's a beautiful photograph of a beautiful rose, but it doesn't give you a sense of scale. Um, 
Same with this one, with uh, one of my, I kept Mother's Love. After this, I just love this little sweet little rose. It's really nice. So I have my, my finger in it to show a sense of scale. But I started, this was a really, I started working this, there's, there's a bright area up in the side. So I started working the scene a little bit. It's almost exactly the same composition, except I'm a little bit, I moved to my right and looked up. I really like that white space. I love that sense of mood that's created back behind it. Um, it's it's a, almost exactly the same composition, two roses on, on stems, um, but the mood is different by looking up into the, into the sky behind it. Um, so another actually thing I've learned a lot about photographing roses is, not just roses, but most garden plants, to look straight into them. Um, too often we see a beautiful uh, flower and we shoot down on it, and it, it doesn't really show you the beauty of the, of the flower. I mean, I, I, there are beautiful shots to be had looking straight down and artistic interpretations, but to show what a, a plant looks like, it really helps look straight on. I, one of my workshops I call belly shots, and, and I, yeah, as I get older, it's harder to do them, but, <laughs> but it's, really, <laughs> it's really important to try to get low down onto the subject and look straight into it so that you can you know, get, get these stems. It really says something about, about what you're doing. Um, this is a tiny rose, huh? Look at this link. It's called C. I don't, I don't know. It's, I, think, I think we picked it because it was the smallest rose anyone knew. Uh, so I used my daughter's uh, dollhouse um, in a, to, begin to, to get a sense of scale. You know? So whenever you're trying to think, what are you photographing, and you get a sense of scale, it was really fun to, to put those together. I don't, know where, I don't even remember where we got the little vase that went with a, with a doll set, but it was, it, it was fun. Um, and then there's a whole series here of, of just this, uh, this miniature, this, another one I kept, Magic Carousel. I just kept it as a, because um, I love the color. It, it, it blooms on and on and on. It's a really nice miniature rose. Um, it's also, we we're really lucky that when I was doing that, this book, there was a Mayfair going on. I was living in Sonoma at the time, and, there's, uh, and my wife, my kids went to Waldorf schools. And there's always a Mayfair in the, every May. There's wonderful, you know, innocent joy of May, and so this one of the girls was just needed a crown, and so I, I asked her if we make us make one with miniature roses, because I was shooting the book, so we, we went all out on it, but it was just so much fun just to have, you know, the, a, a, an excuse to work with the roses and create this. Um, it was really different from that back up. I, was, I meant to be the segue between, you know, this model, not, not nearly as nice as this one. You know, this is really, <laughs> it's really something much different going on here. Um, as this one, actually, I'm, I'm going to leave it up there just a minute. I lost this picture for, for the past 15 years. Um, when I was putting this presentation together in the past few days, I was going through my old books that I did with uh, Ray Ray Dell, and all of it was film. And it's, um, I got some nice pictures there, but it's really a pain to scan all those things to get them quality. You know, you can't, you can, you can any of you who have old pictures know. You can get a cheap scan, and it looks like crap, and it's not worth using. And I've got hundreds of thousands of, of old slides that many of them are portfolio grade or really lovely, but I just don't have a chance to scan them. I've got new work to do. I really like working with the, with the digital files now. Um, but this, this, this exact presentation was, gave me an excuse to go through some of these old files, and all these next few are, are photos I haven't seen in years. And it was really fun to be able to, to pull them out um, again. And, Actually, as I decided I'm going to write, write a book on photographing roses, it'll be one of my e-books and my new thing, These, this presentation really made me realize I've got a lot of roses, and I, I, a lot of rose pictures, and there are, a lot of them are pretty nice. So um, this was one, um, Pascali, I forget which of the books it was in, um, but I, I had a, a stylist who, actually, any of you who are, read garden books, I'm sure you must know of Mrs. Dalloway's books in Berkeley. It's a fantastic bookstore, it's an independent bookstore, the best place to buy garden books, a huge section. The woman who owns it, Ann Leahy, is a friend of mine, and she was my stylist when I was doing these books. So she was, um, long before she opened her bookstore, um, we, we found a location and made this uh, bouquet, and I photographed it from the inside looking out, and I went from the outside looking in. Um, it's this exact same bouquet, um, Exact same, the, the yellow lemons really help. There's a little bit of yellow in Pascali, so the, the, the lemons help pick that up. I love Anne's idea to put on a red sweater while she was photographing. Um, but go back, it's the same, same window, um, we, same, same props basically, just 
working the scene, trying to find different ways to photograph the same thing. Um, when, when you're in a garden, this, this, these are styled shots, but the same thing applies. If you're in a really good garden and your you're, thing's looking good, work it. Don't just take the first shot you take, work it. I mean, just, you know, you, your ideas later may change what you like the best. I, this is the one we use in the book, but, but I really find I like this one quite a bit now. I hadn't, I hadn't looked at this in, oh gosh, it must be 15 years. And I, I really like the way this one um, played out. Um, this was Anne's youngest daughter who still wasn't quite old enough to fill out the wedding dress. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a lovely bouquet of Jean Keneally. Um, actually, I, again, it's sort of fun to having done this because uh, Anne and I still remain friends and Claire, her oldest daughter, just got married in the wine country last, or it's a year ago now. But um, she would uh, there's, I actually have a shot of this where she's smiling in a very innocent face. She must be 12 years old when, she, when I took the picture. And um, I don't know, uh, I think she'd love to see it. But this, this is great, to, again, to, to find a scene and, and work it. Um, we created a whole wedding scene for it. Um, I also had a whole se a sequence of Rose's photos for the books. There was a uh, photographer 20 years ago named Steve Lovey who created a whole line of, of gardening cards where he did these lush backgrounds, um, uh, wallpapers and fabrics, and created these um, you know, elements. So I, it's delightful to me to go through and find some of these old pictures. I was mimicking what, what Steve Lovey was doing at the time, just creating these, these lush combinations of, of flowers. Um, th this one was shot because th this is mini pearl in the middle. But again, while we're shooting these, these books, we had buckets and tons of roses, just a, you know, this pretty delightful job to be doing this kind of stuff. And so, so we had, you know, had my, my pruning shears on my potting table and um, just threw the roses down. We had to have a, a hero shot, I call it, the main shot for, for Mini Pearl, but it was just fun just to play with them and find colors that work together and sort of, you know, the composition is, is surrounding, you know, the, 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 the shape, the shape of the Mini Pearl is in the middle. Um, okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, Ronnie mentioned she and I did a project uh, two years ago now, I guess, um, where we went to um, a vintage gardens. Uh, uh, Greg Lowry, who's, uh, Greg's here later um, this afternoon, to photograph a lot of very, what, you know, I forget why, how we decided which roses to use, just our own personal appearance, what we liked, what we thought looked great. Um, and we created a series of really high resolution, very tack sharp images. I'm going to show you a couple in a minute. Um, but this was a collection. I don't think, Ronnie, you probably haven't seen this. Um, some of the roses we, over a over course of, of weeks, we would go and pick roses and um, use those one great day. I don't forget, I think we ended up with 12 final, but we, we shot, I shot many more than that. Um, and this is in my studio. I have, my studio is my garage. Um, I can just clear out, my wife, actually it's nice we have a garage, my wife loves to keep her car parked inside, but I'm able to put in um, a, uh, a background. You can see this uh, small background, of the, gray, the, the gray paper, and then I have various lights. There's two lights here, and these are re this, uh, white cards, just, just, just to reflect light into the scene. Um, so I can just set up, you know, put it on a, on a, on a light case, uh, put the, um, the, the group of flowers there, and and light it accordingly. Now, this is part of the, the, the fun and challenge of, a, of a lighting, is each of these lights has a different intensity. It's hard to tell from this, from this shot, but the, each one is, is lit a little bit differently, so you can add different amounts of shadow and fill around the scene. Um, this, is, this, this, um, this next one, this is uh, Madame Isaac Perrier, which is my most fragrant rose. Now, having listened to the previous presentation, I'm going to rethink fragrance. Um, <laughs> But, all, but Madame Isaac Perrier is not as prolific, I think, as the rose perfume folks need. But Perrier is this, it's one of my 13. It's one that I have. So when Ronnie and I finished shooting the uh, books, the uh, photos, the roses from Vintage Gardens, we still were hoping to try to find a few more. They, whenever you do a, a shoot like that, you can't, we couldn't shoot for weeks. We had to only shoot for a couple of days. So we, we shot what we, what we could. And I also included um, Madame, uh, Madame Isaac Perrier. Um, I want you to look closely. Oh, actually, this ended up being a book. Uh, the book just came out. Well, a friend of mine, Fran Soren, I write regularly on a gardening blog called Gardening Gone Wild. Um, Fran owns it, and uh, she, her new book is Digging Deep. It was really uh, delightful. It's her 10th edition, and she really wanted to use uh, a new photograph for it. So this rose became the cover of the book, 
and how we got to this, um, once I let me back up, you can see I, I got the rose and I stuck it in just a very simple um, uh, stem holder and looked straight down on it. Um, and I, I did a series of uh, what's called photo stacking. If you look at this next frame, look closely. See, so it got closer to it, right? Um, then the, in order to get really good depth of field, um, with any kind of macro work, your, your focus is very narrow. You, it's, a, it's a function of optics and cameras, but with macro work, you don't have much depth of field. With digital, you can overcome that now by what's called stacking of, of images. So I can photograph the first image really close. You can see almost the, the, the bottom is in focus. And then through a series of sometimes as few as seven, sometimes as many as 20 different exposures, I'll get to the point where then I can, I can isolate the background. It's now super sharp. And then I do, I'm also doing a series of prints from it. So I have a, a print. You can see the, the, the paper edge, for, there's a torn edge. Um, but it, the stacking process is done by taking a lot of pictures. Um, so um, I'm going to shoot, this one is Alan Blanchard. This is, this is what I look at with my computer. When I, when I edit my film, this is from the shoot that I did with Ronnie. So each of the roses, you know, let's say there's, there's multiple stacks. Um, so that when I take the computer, I can just layer all the different focal points together. It'll be really, really sharp. Um, so for instance, the, um, the Alan Blanchard was at the very top. And that was the, one of the frames of it. I, I, I photographed it so I could position it so I could look straight onto it. What we wanted for Ronnie's job was, that, was just the flower. We weren't trying to get any stem or leaves. So we're able to, to, um, to cut it out later. So this, is, is, th this one didn't take a, more than about six or seven different stacking frames because as a, as, a, as a single petal rose, it doesn't have a lot of depth to it anyway. So it didn't take a whole lot. But if you, but if you to look at these, the focus between every edge is just tack, tack sharp. Um, it's, a really fun, it's the only way you can really do this um, with any sort of garden photography, garden plants is in the studio because if you, I've done it. I've tried to do it outdoors, but the wind moves so that it just—it's a nightmare. It just doesn't line up later. You get you get really raggedy edges. Um, so, a lot of you hopefully know these books. I just really had a blast. And Claire Martin um, is not, and he's here somewhere. I haven't seen him yet, but I, he and I collaborated on these books many years ago, um, and it was a really uh, it was a great privilege really to do it. We went through, we first had the contract to do the book. We had an art director in uh, New York and said, well, I'm not sure how we're going to do this. Uh, Claire wants to have a sort of encyclopedia kind of book where they information on one side and just a picture on the other. What kind of photo style is going to work? I went through several tests back and forth, FedExing to New York, different types of techniques that worked um, until I, I came a, um, across an idea of laying the roses down. Um, I'll, I'll show you. These are, this, is Bell, this is Bell Story and um, uh, Aust Aust Austrian Copper. And so you can see um, these are the prints I, I later made from them. Um, I have a whole series of these that you know, I, I put the, the plate name and the name of the plant in it. Um, it's, it's really fun. The, but the way they came about is I would travel around. Um, we, we photographed in um, the Huntington Botanic Garden at Greg Lowry's place and at Airlevel Garden Roses in Portland. We had three different seasons. Each is about two or three weeks apart. So we had these weeks apart. I could we'll go shoot for about three, two or three, four days in each place. The, um, uh, the Rosarian at each place would help me decide what the right, exactly the right day was to photograph it. And they, they in each case, he or Claire. Anyway, the, the Rosarian would always pick the roses for me and tell me, this is the right shot, today is the day. And we'd pick them and put them in a bucket. Um, and then the course of the day, I had a portable um, a countertop, a white countertop. I, I painted it, found the brightest white I could put the countertop down the ground, had strobe lights around it, and shot down on the rose. But the hardest part was making the rose look real. The roses look up at the sun. And in order to make it look real, like a botanic illustration, we had to explode them. Um, so, each, each, each of the roses is very often a dozen different pieces that we had to um, piece together. Um, and it was a great challenge to do it. Um, 
the, almost the hardest part was taking the, the, the rose itself because it, the rose wants to look up rather than out. So that's, that's the first we realized we had to cut the roses and they're little pieces of, um, you can't really sell, tell because it's my job so you can't see it, but they're little pieces of clay un underneath it sort of holding it all in place. And we, we worked really hard um, of moving each stem so you can't tell later. See that where it drops in? I, I learned to study the roses and, and figure out which leaves are turned which way and where the nodes are so that when you drop things in, it would look real. So you can drop this back in there and it, it, looks, it looks real. Um, so what's really fun now is to go back and look at the, um, and look at the roses that, that are finished and imagine what's real and what was put together. And, and, <laughs> and in no case, are they, it was never one that was just straight on because the roses again always look straight up. So there's never one where the stem was all right and then we just you know, had to put the roses in. There, every one, um, if you look carefully, uh, you probably can't tell from the background. It's, it's kind of a fun thing you look at when you look at the book. If you, if you have a print, I sell prints of these things. You can look at them and say, well, wait a minute, it doesn't quite line up there. You know, it's not quite right. Um, but I found myself twisting the leaves so they, would, so they would look up. And during the course of a day, shooting these things, the hardest thing often was, was trying to get the leaves to stay fresh. The roses would stay, if they're a good cut rose, it's, it's, chill, it's picked early in the morning and it's in a bucket of cold water. The rose itself is not going to change very much. It might open a little bit, but the, but the leaves were the biggest challenge and how the leaves would, would actually fade. Um, I was really pleased to go through some, all these are my favorites. Uh, these are all available as prints. I have a box of them in the car I forgot to bring in. But um, they're, all, um, they're, all, they're all my favorites. So I don't know, you know, it's hard to go into the story of each one, but it really is fun to try to figure out where the elements are. And some, here's in, in Pat Austin, there's, the leaves are, are slightly uh, uh, shiny. So that's important. Um, and whereas the, there's, um, the Alexander Rose, the leaves are terrible. Um, it's really bad for leaves, but we had to show them. I, I love single petal rose, so I think this is my, of, of the whole sequence, this one is my favorite, the Alexander Rose. I just, I just love that rose. Um, but the leaves are really, tar really, really pretty tatty. Um, so we look, I mean, I can, we got more ground to cover here, so I can't talk about each one too much. Um, but just imagining, you know, even here, I was careful using this leaf to hide the way the stem connected because it, it, wasn't, it wasn't working. So here, I can just move that leaf there. Um, I mean, even here, you can see where this leaf comes down. You, you can hide these things. I mean, you can, it's, it's, a, it's a real blast to look at them, especially now you can see these. You know, how did he do that? Well, it's all, it's all just pieced together. <laughs> you couldn't even do that in Photoshop because Photoshop doesn't allow you the scale. This really had to be done physically with the, with the various pieces. I'm sort of jealous of the uh, botanic illustrators who, who don't have to worry about that sort of realism. I've got to do it exactly the way the camera sees it. Um, it's tough to work with these, uh, all the spines of the uh, Comtesse de Mernays. Again, it's fine. I'm just, not right now. I'm just, I'm just seeing these leaves, they don't really there is a slight swelling, there's a slight node there, so the leaf does go there, but it's not, you know, if, if, the, if you know, I'm sure all of you study roses, the, um, this structure of the leaf would, would be more clasping around the stem itself. So it's, you know, it's not, it's not as real as a, as a real rose person might, might think. Um, this is one, this is from my own garden. I mentioned I have the rambling roses growing in my place, uh, I think apple blossom, is my favorite. Um, so I, I, I just saw it one day, I just, I was, I hadn't, wasn't even planning to take pictures. This actually often happens to me. I'm working in my office, if I'm not traveling, I'm, I'm focused on my computer. I spend so much time on the computer trying to get the editing and my work done. Um, I go out in the garden just for a breath of fresh air. And it was in May when the apple blossom was blooming. Um, so I decided I'd better, I, I, I put it in the studio. Um, you can, I'll back up, it's the exact same, you know, just, ex so I, I, I put it in a little stem vase and I'm, ho I'm holding it upright with a little clamp and the background doesn't make much difference what the background is here. I, I didn't use a piece of paper, I just used a, a 
a piece of cardboard, poster board of some kind, because I knew I was going to be taking it out later. So it didn't make any difference what the background was, as long as it was fairly neutral. It wouldn't, I couldn't shoot against the, the garage because I'd have a lot of conflicting shapes. I needed a very clean shape so that when I go into Photoshop, a tool called masking, you create a mask, and you can cut the, cut the background out. Um, so it's the exact same shot, just, just cut it out later. So that's, now, um, and that's apple blossom, that's, that's the blossoms they came from, um, right in the garden. Um, I have them growing, I say the eucalyptus trees are about 30 feet tall now. Um, and all the, uh, actually I lost, in fact, I was talking to Ronnie, I lost two of my roses three years ago. I finally cut, I topped the eucalyptus and I sprayed, I, I girdled them um, with a chainsaw so that they, they would stay upright for 30 feet, but I didn't want them to sprout again. So I put straight roundup into where I cut the, the girdle. Well, I lost two roses, they were growing right next to it. So I, I, still, I still need one actually. <laughs> so, um, but it's, it's great in May when the, you know, the roses are 30 feet up and they're just cascading down. And then I can just pick a cluster and take it in the studio. Um, so the last section of the, of the presentation, I don't know how we're doing on time, is just simply finding a good garden to photograph in. These are all just, actually these are all in the same garden, um, a private garden in Napa. Peter McGowan, who uh, has, he's become a rose nut. He's a, I, I, he's a hero of mine because he's a, an executive guy who rescued the giants from leaving to go to Tampa. And uh, he was head of Safeway, I guess. Anyway, he's, the rose bug has bitten, bitten him big time. And he now has a garden that he, he, he mimics um, one of uh, David Austin's own formal gardens. In, um, but it's, it's, it's going, so as I was saying earlier, you find a good scene, just work it. So uh, Peter has a lot of uh, rose arches going through the garden. Um, and then I'll come in and just find areas of it that I can make close-up shots of. It's all the same, it's all the same rows, but it's a matter of, of working the scene and trying to, to fill the frame up. Again, I don't want to fill it with a total macro shot. I like having this amount of space left over, you know, the spaces between it. It's, it's a pleasing composition. And the closer you can get on it, you can, it's okay if the summit goes out of focus, as long as something is really, really tack sharp. Um, so this is the, uh, one, one, the, the David Austin uh, garden that, that McGowan has. This is looking into it, look out of it, and looking into it. It's the same, again, you, you try to find a nice scene, you work around it, looking in and out, and really trying to make something that really works. Um, lots of arbors throughout the place. Just a, a, a joy to be able to photographing roses. And this is one of the, except, section, one of the exceptions to the rules of trying not to fo photograph the sun. I've been trying in the past five or six years now to really work with light a lot more strongly in my work. Um, again, because editors are looking for sun in gardens, so I was sort of forced to do that. But then I'm realizing, especially early in the day or late in the day, when the sun, the sun's very bright, but the rest of the uh, sky is, is, has a good amount of fill light around it, so you can shoot into the sun um, and still have some, some detail here. Even though it's, it's a bit washed out, it still gives a lively a lightness to it that's really sort of fun. Um, so I'm using light a lot more actively and experimenting with it in my own work now. Um, so it's really fun to, as part of also going on a job really early, I'm always there before the sunrise. I'm often being chased away into the shadows, away from the sun. And in recent years, I've been trying to work with the light and work into the light. So, um, so that's me. Um, I think I got it all done in time. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> so so thanks, I do, so I do have a, a sign-up sheet for my workshop um, and my newsletter and such. If you want to stay in touch, um, that's all I've got for today. So I'll take some questions. Yeah. I do both. I do uh, workshops in person. Um, I'm the photography director of the Botanical Garden. I run workshops at the Botanic Garden. But I find um, the timing for those is often troublesome for me because I, I like photographing myself. And so the workshops are online. You subscribe to it, and it's a series of lessons that you can subscribe to. And my website's called photobotanic.com. So that's, but that site's about two or three weeks away from being live. So, um, but if you sign up, I'll, I'll, I'll feed you information about it. So, any more questions though? Yes, sir. Do you have a preference of cameras? Preference of cameras? Uh, 
Yeah, I use a, a, a Canon 5D. Um, the reason is the Canon, when I switched years ago from, from uh, um, analog camera to digital, Canon was the only one that had a full frame sensor. Um, and the sensor on it is a uh, 35 millimeter, is the old film size, but that was because the film was 24 by 36 millimeters, exactly two to three ratio. Um, and all the new cameras that came out were three to four. It's a different ratio entirely, and the lenses were very strange, and Canon was the only maker who, at that time, made a full frame sensor. Uh, so I sold all of my Leica and Nikon gear at the time to switch to Canon, and now I'm sort of uh, stuck with it. But Canon makes very good stuff, so I use, you know, that's what I use. Do you just take one camera with you on shoot? I take two. I take one that I shoot with, I have a backup, in case the other one jams or fails. But I don't, I, I've, since I've been digital, I've, uh, cameras never fail on me. So I always have a backup in case it does. But I don't, I carry a snapshot camera. When I'm, when I'm shooting just candids or I'm scouting shots, I'll take s snapshots you know, just for my memory books. And, um, but I, for professionally, I always use the, um, the, the big camera on a tripod. I just, I'm a, it's, it's almost for me, a tripod is like a safety mechanism. It, it allows me to be sure of what I'm doing, you know, and it just allows me to slow, force me to slow down. So I, I don't take any professional pictures without a tripod. So, so. You had a picture, a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> Any more? Okay. I have a. Um, that's a good question. I have a. Um, I have a shutter release and a mirror lockup. Um, when you when you take a picture, um, the process of a SLR camera is there's a there's a there's a mirror that you see through the, the viewfinder that the mirror has to open to let the light in to expose the uh, the sensor. When that mirror opens, it creates vibration. Um, very subtle, but enough to notice. So I, I use a, um, a mirror lockup tool. So I, I'll, I'll click my shutter. I'll get my composition just the way I want. I'll click the shutter. The mirror opens. It locks up. And I'll wait a second, sometimes a couple seconds, and click it again. And that, that way, it's dead still. The camera is not moving at all at that point. So um, it's, a, it's a little troublesome, because when the mirror locks up, you can't see. Anymore, so if something's something's moving, you, it's really hard for macro work sometimes. But um, it doesn't for for, my, for for landscape stuff. If a little bit of, of wind, it's it's not bad at all. It creates some some drama. Some you know a, a moving branch in a landscape scene is 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 not objectionable at all, unless that's what you're focusing on. But um, so once I lock up the camera, I don't really care if a little bit of things move. So okay, Ronnie. <laughs>